Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 806, Expressing Goodwill. Amandina? If it were anyone else, Franca might not have remembered, but she couldn't forget this participant of the Dream Festival, a girl who called the underworld Taoist her teacher. Franca later summoned the armored Shadow Chen Tu for more information, and she might even need Amandina's help. With this in mind, Franca reached into her traveler's bag and counted her accumulated gold, including the final payment from a member of the curly-haired Baboon Research Society, she now had gold worth 82,000 verl d'or and nearly 20,000 verl d'or in cash. With a little exchange, it would be enough to meet the requirements of the armored shadow, Chen Tu, for a conversation. Of course, Franca didn't plan to do this anytime soon. First, Lumian was in Morora. Without using his special connection with the contract target, even knowing the armored shadow's name as Chen Tu, Franca wasn't sure she could summon the spirit from the original world. After all, that might not be its true name, and translating it into ancient Hermes or other mystical languages might correspond to different spirit world creatures. Secondly, facing the armored shadow without a demigod present would likely be extremely dangerous. Amandina's presence might partially substitute for a demigod, intimidating the armored shadow. Should we wait for Lumian to return from Morora before summoning Chen Tu again? Franca felt a mix of excitement and apprehension, a state known as near-home anxiety. After a moment, she exhaled slowly, deciding to respond to Amandina on Lumian's behalf. Hmm, Lumian promised to take Amandina to the area around the Samaritan Woman's Spring, giving her a chance to meet the underworld Taoist outside of the Dream Festival. This is beneficial for us, but it's too dangerous with my current strength. Besides, I'm not sure if the power brought by the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings combined with the Tarot Club's minor arcana identity can penetrate the fog around the Samaritan woman's spring. We should wait until Lumian is out of Morora. For now, I'll show Amandina some goodwill to lay the groundwork for future cooperation. Hmm, I'll organize some important mysticism knowledge and give it to Amandina for free. Show some respect for the higher authority, if not for me. If the underworld Taoist sees how well I treat his disciple, maybe his attitude will change. Also, I'll ask Amandina which path of the divine she wants to take besides the power of the boons and help her get the corresponding potion formulas and materials. This won't be free. Giving everything for free would make us look too humble and lead to disrespect. Too much kindness can turn into resentment. Amandina should choose between the paths of darkness, death, and warrior. The potion formulas and characteristics for the mid to low sequences of the warrior path are relatively easy to find. Maybe we can ask Madam Justice to get help from Mr. T Star for the darkness path. He seems to be a high-ranking member of the Evernight Goddess Church, Last time, he wore red gloves. Perfect timing, I was about to report the secrets of the demoness sect taught by the demoness of black and mention Amandina's situation to see what mysticism knowledge can be shared and what can't be leaked. Having sorted her thoughts, Franca returned to her bedroom, sat at her desk, and began writing her report. South Continent Port Port Pilos of Matani in a three-story white marble villa. Having finally made up her mind and sent out that letter, Amandina grew more awake as the night went on, pacing back and forth in her soft, girlish bedroom, waiting for Lumian's reply. The more she learned about mysticism and Beyonders, the more she realized the gap between herself and Lumian and how ignorant she had been. Though she felt she could continue living as she had, maintaining the appearance of a normal high society person with certain supernatural abilities, the events during the Dream Festival and the rumors she had heard from various mysticism circles made her feel a sense of crisis and urgency. Living in the South Continent in an era of increasing disasters, her sequence seven nightmare powers and current situation of facing everything alone made her truly afraid that one day her entire family would become sacrifices in a rose school of thought blood ritual or that the hidden problems of the Dream Festival would suddenly erupt and engulf her. The more she knew, 
the more afraid she became. Amandina felt she could never return to her previous state of ignorance and recklessness, and she had a strong desire for higher sequences and more extraordinary power. That would mean she could do more and see more. Suddenly, she saw the same cool-looking charred messenger from before emerge from the void, handing her a small dressing mirror. A mirror? What does Lumian Lee mean by giving me a mirror? Amandina accepted the mirror with curiosity and confusion, feeling it was quite ordinary. She was about to ask the penitent Baneful when she noticed a dark, aqueous light spreading across the mirror's surface. As the light flowed, the mirror gradually brightened, revealing a figure. A mystic telegraph, and one where you can see and talk to the other person. How fascinating. Amandina didn't notice the messenger leaving, her attention entirely captivated by the mirror. She soon realized that the figure in the mirror wasn't Lumian Lee, but a stranger, a woman. The woman had lake-colored eyes, both bright and deep, as if hiding countless words that made one want to explore them. Her nose was delicate and straight, her lips a tempting combination of red and tender white skin, and her eyebrows extended to her temples, with her flaxen hair tied into a ponytail, giving her an air of elegance. So beautiful. Amandina stared blankly, instinctively admiring the woman in her mind. She herself was a girl of outstanding appearance and had always been proud of it, but this time she felt no sense of competition, entirely immersed in a beauty she had never seen before. Her gaze naturally lowered, seeing the smooth, slender neck and the lace flowers around the shirt collar. For some reason, Amandina felt an urge to see the entire body of the woman in the mirror to see how beautiful she would look naked. She felt this wasn't her own problem. Even Padre Kali, who only liked men would surely have a similar urge, using a bit of charm to enhance goodwill for easier communication. Franca also observed Amandina. This girl had a waterfall of black hair and blue eyes, exuding a youthful energy of free self-expression. All of Lumian's female acquaintances are quite beautiful, is this a hunter's talent? Franca smiled sweetly through the glass mirror. Lumian is busy right now and can't leave, so he asked me to communicate with you. Amandina snapped out of her daze, shaking off the spell of the woman's beauty. She looked at Franca in the mirror, curiosity and a desire to explore igniting within her. You're Lumian, eh? Monsieur Lumian Lee's friend, the one who might need my help in the future. Yes, Franca smiled and nodded. HMPH, and you say you're not lovers. Such a beautiful woman makes even me, who likes men, want to sleep with her. How much more for a man who doesn't like men? Amandina felt she had seen through Lumian's lie. She straightened her waterfall-like hair and asked brightly, I'm willing to help you. Can you keep your promise? That might have to wait until Lumian finishes his current tasks. And you're not strong enough yet, Franca said succinctly. Do you want to advance through potions besides the power of boons? Which path do you want, death, darkness, or warrior? Franca spoke quickly because the power of the ice amulet was limited in time. After posing the question, she suddenly thought of something. It is said that the warrior path's potions has a significant height-enhancing effect even turning the drinker into a giant at higher levels. Hmm, turning such a pretty girl into a three or four meter tall giant beauty seems odd. Franca wasn't sure if she was worried or looking forward to it. Amandina had discussed with Lumian which paths she could take and had thought seriously about it, so she quickly made her decision. Darkness as a girl who had always been good at understanding her parents' thoughts and was adored by her elders, Amandina felt that since the figure during the Dream Festival had only given her the power of darkness and not the death power given to Robert or the warrior power given to some gravekeepers, it might mean that he wanted her to be pure and focus on the path of darkness. She also planned to go to the ancient tomb during the next Dream Festival to receive more gifts naturally not wanting to disappoint that figure. I still want to see what happens when the power of the death or warrior path is mixed with the darkness boon. Franca said seriously, 
I will inquire and gather the necessary things for you, but you need to pay for it or complete tasks I assign. Amandina was no longer the naive girl she used to be and understood the value of potion formulas and Bayonder ingredients. She nodded. Okay. Franca smiled in the mirror. Also, I appreciate you agreeing to help. No matter what Lumian promised you, I will provide you with some extra mysticism knowledge for free. Really, Amandina was delighted. This beautiful lady is truly generous, and it's not a trap. The potion formulas and Bayonder ingredients come at a cost. Franca didn't answer directly but smiled and said, Remember, my name is Franca. As she spoke, she raised her right hand and pushed a stack of stapled papers forward. In Amandina's eyes, the stack grew larger, eventually penetrating the glass and falling into her hands, while Franca's image disappeared from the mirror. Franca, Lumian Lee and she make a good match. Amandina imagined Lumian and Franca together, suddenly having some romantic thoughts. She whispered to herself, that must be beautiful. I'd love to see it. Suppressing the images in her mind, Amandina looked at the papers in her hand. Glancing over a line of words, Law of Bayonder Characteristics Convergence. W.H. Amandina was both bewildered and deeply impressed. Morora, late night. After the carnivore bar closed, Lumian exited through the back door and saw Gusain wearing a top silk hat. Gusain slowly smiled. I'll take you to the place for your test now. Chapter 807, Overlooked. Morora's night was devoid of streetlights, relying solely on the crimson moon high above to provide light, casting deep darkness and dense shadows everywhere. Gusain, dressed like a gentleman, carried a lantern as he led Lumian to a neighborhood near the edge of the city. The area had been completely abandoned due to a small volcano that had erupted, swallowing several houses and leaving a charred wasteland in its wake. The place you mentioned isn't at the base of the volcano, is it? Lumian glanced around, adjusted his cuff, and smiled. Gusain nodded slightly. Yes, the volcanic eruption affected the underground part of the cemetery, allowing its power to seep out. The lava receded quickly, leaving behind an empty void. If you can find the right path through the void filled with the fog of war and reach the designated spot, it will prove you have the qualifications to join us in penetrating the underground part of the cemetery. Fog of War Gusain had been using this term to describe the underground fog, which seemed to have leaked from the mausoleum containing Zuzan I, which represents the Red Priest. Lumian didn't conjure a bright white fireball for illumination. Instead, he followed Gusain, who carried the lantern, into a building on the edge of the volcanic area. Inside the house, filled with solidified volcanic rock, they descended a precarious staircase into a partially collapsed basement. The basement walls had a gaping crack leading to a void filled with dense fog. You need to reach this point near the cemetery's underground section and light the oil lamp between four stone statues. Remember, there are four statues facing each other in pairs. Gusain hung the lantern on a protruding stone brick in the wall crack and took out a simple map, pointing to the destination. Lumian studied the map for a minute, then turned his gaze to the dense fog outside the crack. What's special about this fog? Gusain pressed his top hat and smiled. It significantly reduces your visibility, affects your hearing and smell, suppresses your astral projection's interaction with the spirit world and dulls your spiritual warning and intuition. And, Lumian asked, seemingly relaxed. Gusain thought for a few seconds. The fog of war envelops the corresponding spirit world area. Some Bayonders, even if they can enter the spirit world, can't locate themselves or escape the fog. If they try to teleport out, they might get lost somewhere in Morora and never return to reality. Seeing means being able to teleport there. With my hunter's vision, I can only see five or six meters. Lumian roughly understood the fog's effects and laughed. If I could create a hurricane, could I blow it away? We've tried. You can, 
but once the wind stops, the fog comes back, and the dispersal is limited to reality, not affecting the part seeping into the spirit world, Gusain explained the previous experiment's results. Lumian asked a few more details, then conjured a bright white flame to hover above his head. He stepped forward, through the crack, and into the dense fog. Unlike normal fog, this one felt like it had been scorched by fire. As Lumian inhaled, his airways stung with a fiery pain, and his mind filled with the smell of burning, blood, and rust. The dense fog churned, and the ground trembled slightly. Lumian saw tall figures emerging from the fog five or six meters away. These figures were made of black iron, covered in dark red rust, like neglected metal puppets. Some lacked arms, others had disjointed bodies, and some had gaping holes in their chests. They staggered towards Lumian, wielding giant swords that gleamed coldly. Lumian chuckled. Who dug you out of the trash heap? Recycling, huh? Before he finished speaking, he disappeared from his spot, reappearing behind one of the iron puppets. His eyes turned iron black, and his right fist ignited with bright white flames, crashing down on the puppet's waist. Suddenly, a bright white flame spear shot from the crack in the wall, hurtling towards Lumian. Lumian couldn't dodge or use spirit world traversal in time. He could only fall to the ground, following the momentum of his right punch. At the same time, he prepared to swap places with his shadow. Bang! His flaming right fist struck the puppet's waist, creating a spiderweb of cracks. Then, his fist brushed against the metal surface, pulling his body to the ground, narrowly avoiding the white flame spear, though a lock of his hair caught fire. With a clatter, the white flame spear pierced the puppet and landed two meters away, revealing Gusain in his top hat. The invigilator was the attacker, the second most dangerous person in Morora. Creak, creak. The puppet took a step forward out of inertia, then collapsed into a heap of scrap metal. Lumian, lying on the ground, didn't roll away. Since he hadn't gone far from the basement, he teleported to the crack covered in dense fog, moving as far as his vision allowed to escape the fog of war. Once outside, he could either counterattack Gusain or find a chance to escape, both better options than fighting in a preset scenario. Whenever possible, avoid fighting in someone else's setup. As Lumian's figure appeared in the dense fog near the basement crack, he saw a bright white flaming metal spear rushing towards his heart as if waiting for him to come. Besides Gusain, there was another ambusher. Gusain's attack seemed to lure Lumian to teleport towards the exit, stepping into a trap. At this moment, Lumian, in Morora, far from Franca and Jenna, couldn't use their mirror substitution. He could only swap places with his shadow in a flash of light. PFFT. The bright white flaming spear pierced Lumian's chest, setting him ablaze. But Lumian's figure turned thin and black, dissolving like a shadow in the firelight. The spear-wielding man stepped through the crack into the fog of war. His hair was tinged with blood, his features aggressive, and he wore a black and red jacket. He was Albus Medici. Albus Medici, whom Gusain was supposed to be looking for, was here. Lumian's figure reappeared in another direction, but due to the fog of war, he was still within six meters of Albus, Gusain, and the remaining iron puppets. He saw Gusain's forehead glow red, something about to emerge. Albus's hair was covered in red flames, lengthening as it spread. Traitor, Gusain whispered, sentencing him. He then created several bright white fireballs, hurling them at Lumian to cover every corner. He seemed unafraid of affecting himself or Albus, though they were only five or six meters apart, and the fireballs could flatten the carnivore bar. Hearing Gusain's words and seeing Albus's stance, Lumian understood why he was attacked. He had overlooked the iron and blood cross order. This secret organization, primarily following the hunter path, was also searching for Zerzin-1. Over the years, someone had likely infiltrated Morora. One of them was Gusain. With the core members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order's strange connection to Fourth Epoch Trier, 
they could maintain some self-awareness in Morora. Using Zizan 1 to sense the approaching enforcement team made sense, fitting Gusain's behavior. Now, it seemed Albus Medici was still cooperating with the Elron and Blood Cross Order, using the secret organization. Lumian's attempt to use Gusain's power to find Albus had been turned into a trap. Seeing the incoming bright white fireballs and Albus blocking the exit, Lumian didn't hesitate. His sleeve flashed, and he disappeared again. This time, he left behind a makeup mirror. The mirror fell through the dense fog, cracking as it hit the ground. Rumble. Gusain's fireballs exploded, only affecting a six-meter range, unable to disperse the dense fog of war, confined to a small area. The mirror shattered into countless pieces, some turning to dust, others melting and reforming. Albus, feeling the impact and heat, muttered in confusion, Using the mirror world? Behind the dark void of the mirror, Lumian used the mirror cufflink again, quickly looking forward and finding the fog of war hadn't invaded the dark, web-like tunnels. Indeed, in Morora, the mirror world is special. Lumian dared to trust Gusain and enter the fog of war for the test because he had the mirror cufflink. Of course, with items like the Sword of Courage, he wasn't without fighting strength. But he didn't want to risk it in an enemy's prepared battlefield without knowing Albus's full capabilities. Lumian chose a mirror mark in Morora and used Spirit World Traversal to leave. As he vanished, the dark void behind the mirror silently collapsed with its shattering. Lumian's destination was Julie's room mirror. Upon arrival, he looked through the glass, finding Julie, the demoness, nowhere to be seen, not even asleep in bed. Lumian's lips curled into a smile. Chapter 808, Return Not far from the abandoned neighborhood, Albus Medici, who had parted ways with Gusain, walked along the shadows by the roadside toward the cemetery. Suddenly, he stopped, as if sensing an undercurrent in the nearby darkness. Albus chuckled, and a dense fog immediately surged out, covering his figure and half the street. After several seconds, the fog gradually dispersed, but Albus was no longer there. He had vanished. From the shadow that had just been enveloped by the fog, Julie, with her hair tied up and wearing a slit dress, emerged, staring at the spot where Albus had stood for several seconds. A golden ring with a blue gemstone adorned her left middle finger. Julie looked away, her expression somewhat grim, and headed toward the few blocks where the exiles gathered. Some time later, in the deep darkness of the night, the sharp, painful screams of a man echoed from a room. Lumian returned to the full-length mirror in his room and stepped out, lying down on the bed. After discovering that Julie had quietly left the carnivore bar, he knew the demoness had been secretly following him and Gusain. This was one of his intended outcomes. Otherwise, he wouldn't have discussed searching for Albus Medici and accepting the corresponding test with Gusain at the bar. He had done it to ensure that Julie, temporarily acting as a bartender, would hear it. Although he and Gusain had lowered their voices, the demoness was close enough to catch the crucial information with her enhanced hearing. Of course, Lumian hadn't initially considered Julie as a contingency plan because Gusain had witnessed the demoness castrate Vijpan and had clearly noticed her beauty and charm when she became a bartender. In such a situation, Gusain would likely guess Julie's identity as a demoness and remain cautious, knowing she might have overheard their conversation. Lumian's primary goal was to gauge the progress of the demoness sect regarding Zuzan 1 based on Julie's reaction. If the demoness sect, through the long-term investigation of Celeste and other demonesses, had completed preparations and was only waiting for the final opportunity to act, Julie would avoid creating extra trouble and patiently maintain the status quo. In that case, Lumian would have to closely monitor Julie and Celeste to prevent them from taking the lead. If the demoness sect wasn't confident and still lacked information, Julie would likely use this opportunity to gather more intelligence from Gusain and the rebels connected to him, making her actions more comprehensive. 
Lumion wouldn't need to be as urgent and could allocate time and effort to other investigations. In this regard, he had perfectly achieved his goal. Now, Lumion was more curious about Julie's reaction after discovering Albus Medici while following him and Gusain. What would she try to do? Will she attempt an assassination on the spot, wait patiently to challenge Albus alone after he and Gusain part ways, or go find Celeste to discuss it first? It's a pity I don't know where they'll encounter each other, so I can't observe the battle and see what cards they hold. If I'm lucky, I might even eliminate them both if they end up badly injured. Lumian sighed regretfully on the bed. After a while, he sensed some movement from Julie's room. The demoness had returned. Lumian sniffed the air and detected a faint smell of blood. He chuckled inwardly and mocked, Albus, did you lose your prized possession? I wonder if you can regrow it as an iron-blooded knight. There wasn't much commotion in Morora just now, not like there was a fierce battle. So, did Julie fail to locate Albus and vent her frustration on some random guy? Lumian waited patiently, ensuring the city of exiles, Morora, fell into a deep slumber, then transformed into a shadow creature and blended into the darkness of the room. He moved swiftly, returning to the abandoned neighborhood with the volcano, and arrived at the crack in the basement, once again gazing into the void filled with dense fog. He felt it was necessary to investigate this area thoroughly to better understand some details in the Zuzel One ceiling information and gain further insight into the underground mausoleum. Neither Gusain nor Albus would expect him to return here, especially after the possibility of facing Julie's attack. The fog isn't as dense as before. The visibility range is about 13 or 14 meters. Was it Albus and Gusain enhancing the fog of war with their abilities or items earlier? Lumian observed the fog for a few seconds, making a preliminary judgment. He then conjured a bright white fireball for illumination and slowly walked into the fog of war. The fog felt similar to before, with no other changes. Lumian dripped a few drops of perfume on the ground every so often to mark his path for the return journey. He was heading to the area marked with statues on the map Gusain had shown. In the dead silence, only the faint sound of footsteps echoed in the fog as Lumian discerned the terrain, passing several iron puppets hidden in the fog. Finally, relying on his hunter abilities and the memorized map, he reached his destination. There, against the rock wall, stood four statues made of gray-white stone, each over two meters tall. These statues faced each other in pairs, their faces blurred, dressed in peculiar clothing, with square scarves wrapped around their heads. In the middle of the statues stood a half-height stone platform with an unlit oil lamp on it. Who made these statues? They weren't originally here. According to the Zeros in One ceiling information, this place isn't part of the underground mausoleum, it's just normal underground. After the volcanic eruption, some of the mausoleum's power leaked out, and someone built these four statues and placed the oil lamp here. What's the purpose? Lumian mused silently, staring at the bright white fireball. Judging by the style of the statues and the overall arrangement, he doubted the Church of Knowledge had set them up to reinforce the seal. It was more likely the work of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, which explained Gusain's familiarity with the area. Meanwhile, Lumian felt the call from underground growing stronger. It seemed to be just behind the rock wall, waiting for him to approach. Lumian took a deep breath, suppressing his inner urge. He circled the statues and the oil lamp on the stone platform several times, finding nothing unusual. Lumian pondered for a moment and had two ideas. One was to light the oil lamp and see what happened. The other was to take this opportunity to destroy something and trigger a possible change. Lighting the oil lamp is too risky. It's not necessary yet. Lumian decided on the second idea after some thought. Destruction is always easier than construction. And if something went wrong, leaving a mess behind would be more meaningful than keeping the place intact. Lumian conjured a bright white fireball placing it at the base of one of the statues, setting it to explode with a delay. 
After setting up five time bombs, Lumian moved about ten meters away, hiding in the dense fog, and snapped his fingers. Rumble. The four statues and the stone platform simultaneously underwent a violent explosion, cracking from the base and collapsing into piles of rubble. The explosion dissipated some of the dense fog, allowing Lumian to see the statues and the platform. No anomalies or dangers appeared. Good. Now, let's see if Gusain or Albus notice the commotion and come to check it out. I'll be hiding here, ready to strike a fatal blow. Lumian grew more puzzled about the statues and the platform, planning to set a simple trap for Gusain that might be overlooked due to its subtlety. If the statues and the platform were crucial, Gusain would rush to confirm the situation, instinctively thinking the destroyer had already escaped to avoid an ambush. Just as Lumian was about to retreat further into the fog, he noticed the five piles of rubble starting to wriggle. They collided and quickly reformed, rising back into their original statue and platform shapes, identical to before. W.H. Lumian's eyes froze. The stone statues and the platform can restore themselves? No wonder the Iron and Blood Cross Order didn't station guards here. They aren't afraid of these things being destroyed. Lumian quickly recovered and tried a new approach. This time, after blowing up the statues and the platform, he used his traveler's bag to collect some of the rubble, waiting a few meters away. The stone statues and the platform restored themselves again, drawing materials from the earth, while the rubble in Lumian's pouch became ordinary stones. Lumian temporarily gave up on destruction, emptied the pouch of rubble, and returned to the statues, picking up the oil lamp with the glass cover. Inside the lamp was a semi-solid, semi-liquid yellowish grease, with a wick seemingly woven from black hair. The more Lumian looked at it, the more familiar it seemed. He began to recall the source of this familiarity. After over ten seconds, he suddenly reached into his traveler's bag and took out an item. It was a pale yellowish-red, semi-solid substance in a transparent glass bottle, with a thick black wick on top. Corpse Wax Candle a candle made from the corpse oils of an iron-blooded knight and a demoness of despair mixed with other substances. The oil lamp on the stone platform resembled it somewhat. Lumian muttered to himself, Magician Magician said that Fourth Epoch Trier and a place in Banzi Harbor were the best scenes for the corpse wax candle. What about the underground mausoleum in Morora, which is very similar to Fourth Epoch Trier? Chapter 809, Additive In the dense fog, Lumian stared at the oil lamp, feeling an urge to light it and see what would happen. Eventually, he controlled himself and refrained from taking the risk. With everything still in a state of chaos and uncertainty, Lumian believed that making any high-risk decisions would be unwise. He also had no intention of taking the oil lamp to trade with Albus Medici for the head of the abscessed hand since the Iron and Blood Cross Order placed the oil lamp here without guarding it, they probably weren't worried about losing it or had many similar lamps. Based on his observations, Lumian deduced that the pale yellow grease in the lamp likely didn't come from iron-blooded knights and demonesses of despair. It was different from corpse wax candles and seemed to be a mixture of mid-sequence hunters and demonesses. Though it's less effective than a corpse wax candle, it should still work in the underground of Morora, which is similar to Fourth Epoch Trier. Lumian reached into his traveler's bag. Just because he couldn't light it or take it didn't mean he couldn't do anything. He planned to add something extra to the oil lamp, ensuring the Iron and Blood Cross Order would face unforeseen complications during their rituals. Lumian took out some old blood powder from the Demon Warlock, Ice Lemon Fish Fillets, a berserk agent from the Night Stalkers, and another bark agent from the same source. He placed them on the half-height stone platform, mixed a bit of each into a brown lump the size of a human finger joint. What do you call this? A cocktail, Lumian chuckled, putting all the materials back into his traveler's bag. He then took out Mr. K's finger, sliced off some flesh, and wrapped it around the brown lump. 
This was a precaution against the iron and blood cross orders inspection hunters from the order would undoubtedly check the oil lamp for any issues before use, as it wasn't always under their strict watch. In Morora, Lumian didn't worry that using Mr. K's finger this way would be detected. Looking at the blood-stained lump, Lumian reluctantly scooped a bit of the semi-solid, yellowish-red substance from his corpse wax candle and smeared it on the lump. A double disguise, combined with a higher sequence, godhood-possessing item, should fool the hunter's noses and eyes. Once the lump was coated with a yellowish-red substance, Lumian examined the candle, reassuring himself, just a eatle bit, it shouldn't affect the number of uses. After putting away the corpse wax candle, Lumian picked up the oil lamp, removed the wick made of woven black hair, and carefully submerged the yellowish-red lump into the semi-solid grease, ensuring it stayed in the desired position. Seeing the lump's yellowish-red color blend with the surrounding grease, leaving only faint traces hidden inside, Lumian breathed in relief and slowly inserted the wick back into the semi-solid grease. After several adjustments, the wick's position and condition finally met Lumian's requirements. He could already imagine the scene. The oil lamp would initially burn normally, with the corpse wax having perhaps a hint of godhood, enhancing the ritual's effect and immersing the iron and blood cross order members in the sensory experience. This would last for 20 or 30 seconds, after which the corpse wax part would burn. This would bring an intense pact-like experience, potentially fatal for some order members with weaker wills. Of course, this might also benefit some members, causing positive mutations, but the corpse wax portion was minimal, and the burn would soon reach the random materials wrapped in Mystic K's flesh. Lumian wasn't sure what the impact would be, but he was confident it would worsen the situation. Just suck on this one, it hit strong. Lumian recalled how South Continent people described East Balam cigarettes, smiling as he addressed the imaginary order members. Then, he cleaned up the traces on the oil lamp and tidied the scattered rubble. Following the faint scent of various perfumes, Lumian found his way back to the basement crack through the dense fog, leaving the area slowly. He transformed into a shadow creature, silently returned to the carnivore bar, and pretended to sleep to avoid an ambush by Albus Medici, Gusain, and others. At six in the morning, Lumian felt refreshed. He rolled out of bed, stretched his neck, and laughed softly. Didn't come? Albus and the others didn't come, neither did Wanak. Do they think I have teleportation abilities, making it hard to kill me outside a special battlefield or without special items? Ha <laughs> ha, you're too hesitant, too cautious. Now I have shadows again, no longer afraid of sunlight, and can block another fatal attack. Lumian drew the curtains, gazing at the brightening dawn, his eyes falling on the books from the Church of Knowledge on his desk. He instinctively felt a headache, frowning. He resisted reading and learning, struggling with an indescribable inner turmoil. If there were only a few books, Lumian would be highly motivated, reading diligently and focusing intently. But knowing there were three whole shelves of books and thousands of scrolls left him feeling defeated, unwilling to start. After several seconds, Lumian rubbed his temples, sighed, and muttered to himself. Well, since Zerzan I was sealed by the Church of Knowledge, I should respect knowledge. There's nothing else to do now, just waiting for Albus and Julie to take further action, hoping to seize an opportunity and direction. Lumian sat down, leaning back in his chair, placing his feet on the edge of the desk, reading the books specified by Haraberg in a comfortable but precarious position. He had read the first two or three chapters before and found nothing noteworthy, but this time he planned to study in depth. As he read, Lumian's expression gradually changed. He became engrossed in the reading, almost forgetting the time until Les knocked on the door telling him breakfast was ready. Okay. Lumian nodded, setting down the book without any visible changes and heading out of the room. Almost at the door, he saw Les turning towards the stairs and half turned back, glancing at the books on the desk with a puzzled expression. 
These books indeed contained important knowledge. He was currently reading one thoroughly and had skimmed through the others, already finding similarities with the details in the Zerzin One sealing information, along with more detailed explanations. If I read through the three bookshelves and pass the exam, I might find a way to approach Zerzin One through the overall sealing operation and use the sealing principles to protect myself when touching the artifact. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is wealth. Knowledge holds all the answers. Lumian withdrew his gaze, his eyes flashing with thoughts as he entered the hallway and turned towards the stairs. The problem now was that this kind of knowledge brought noticeable corruption, just like the zeros and one sealing information. Lumian worried that the more he learned, the closer he got to zeros and one, the more likely he would become its puppet. Also, if I focus too much on reading these books, Albus, Julie, Gusain, and Wanak might get suspicious and also borrow a few books from the Church of Knowledge. Then I would lose my advantage. I need to wander aimlessly every day, set traps for them, outsmart them, and make it seem like I'm just reading out of boredom. Lumian's smile gradually widened. He finished the flight of stairs and glanced at Julie sitting on a bar stool at the counter. The demoness wore a white shirt and black skirt, looking quite demure, but she swayed her waist gently, making the stool spin. She glanced back at Lumian and continued talking to Liz. I only think about finding what I lost from other men when I'm in a terrible mood. Normally, I just feel jealous and resentful, wondering why I lost it, and they still have it. And you, your cooking has conquered me. I acknowledge your right to keep that thing, as long as you don't come to me when I'm in a bad mood, I won't do anything to you. Is that why you demonesses like turning lovers into witches? Lumian sat beside Julie, smiling at Les. What are you guys talking about? Les licked his lips and replied. She asked if I was curious about the taste of demoness meat and cut a small piece for me. Grilled, it was delicious, rich in fat and very chewy. Then we got to the topic we were discussing. Lumian glanced at Julie and noticed the bandage marks on her left shoulder, with some blood stains on her shirt. She really cut it. One daring to cut and the other daring to cook. Your mental states and inner worlds are beyond me. Lumian snorted and directly asked Julie, What are you up to? Julie smiled, showing two shallow dimples. I want to learn cooking from less. Her face was full of longing and expectation to cook for Celeste, you demonesses. Lumian shook his head and focused on his breakfast. Trier, Courtier de la Cathedrale Commemorative, Apartment 702, 9 Rue Orisai. Franker received a reply from Madame Judgment. The letter began. Mr. Tilio Star agrees to provide potion formulas and bay under ingredients in stages for Amandina's matter, but he doesn't need money or resources. He only hopes you can help with some matters. Me? What can I help Mr. Star with? Franca pondered deeply. Chapter 810. Learning is my hobby. Thinking that if it were truly dangerous and beyond her ability to help, Madam Judgment would surely protect her. Franca pulled out a sheet of pure white paper and began her reply. Dear Madam Judgment, if Mr. Tommy Starr's requests are within reason, I have no problem with them. After writing this, Franker read the rest of Madam Judgment's letter. The demoness of Black's description and speculation about the primordial demoness are a common view within the demoness sect. However, if it were that simple, things wouldn't be this complicated. Many high-ranking witches believe the mirror world is vital for the demoness pathway. This isn't entirely inaccurate. But as a collective concept of doors, the mirror world seems incapable of bearing such importance. These are things we need to understand further. Two of Cups, I know this may be harsh, but you still need to continue infiltrating the demoness sect for a while. You are currently our highest ranked member within the sect. Due to the peculiarities of the demoness pathway, we cannot actively cultivate male assassins and the existing demoness sect members are mentally twisted, longing to approach the primordial one. We can only passively wait and find people like you who inadvertently enter the assassin pathway. 
suddenly feeling a heavy sense of responsibility. Franca muttered to herself, sighed, and continued writing her reply. She wasn't too disappointed, still hoping to obtain the main ingredients for the demoness of despair within the sect, provided she found a way to bypass the cruel requirements of the advancement ritual. After sending her reply, Franca leaned back in her chair, gazing idly out the window at the night sky. Suddenly, the area in front of her grew extremely dark, and a silver skull emerged from the void, holding a letter in its mouth. Another letter? What's going on? Franca took it, thanked the messenger, and watched it leave before opening the letter, inhaling its subtle, enduring fragrance. Dear Muggle, do you remember the previous invitation? We're having an offline gathering in Trier this Saturday at 10 p.m. Are you still interested in attending? If so, please reply promptly, and I'll inform you of the location and participation details. Professor An offline meeting of the Academy team? Lumian's life is so eventful. I've barely been his proxy for a few days, and I'm already swamped with tasks, one after another. Should he be called Zoo 7? Even Zoo 7 needs sleep. He doesn't. Franca couldn't help but lampoon. She had already noticed that wherever Lumian went, hidden catastrophes erupted one after another. But since she hadn't been directly involved in most of them, the impact hadn't been as apparent. Now, as his liaison, she felt it keenly. After a while, Franca sighed. She'd have to use the ice amulet to contact Lumian again. Since obtaining it from the Demoness of Black, she hadn't used it for investigating the Mirror People, spending it all on Lumian-related matters. She needed to ask Lumian if he wanted to attend the offline gathering of the Academy team, which might include members of the Moses Ascetic Order. If he did, he'd need to designate a substitute and try to send out the lie earrings. Franca quickly wrote a letter regarding the matter, wrapping a copper coin, some wraith dust, and her rarely used Beatrice's necklace in the paper. She had noticed that after passing through the seal of Morora, Lumian's letters lost their physical form, leaving only pure information. So, she planned to experiment, seeing if ordinary items, highly spiritual items, and Beyonder items could all pass through the seal, and in what state they would exist. The experiment's results would determine if the lie earrings could be sent out. If it weren't for the fact that each mystical item was precious and useful, Franca would have included items containing Beyonder characteristics in this experiment. After preparing the small package, Franca walked to the full-length mirror in the living room, putting on the ice amulet. As it flashed with crystalline cold light, Franca pressed the package into the glass surface. Late at night in Morora, on the second floor of the carnivore bar, Lumian sat under a glowing white fireball, focused on reading examples of underground mausoleum construction. Suddenly, he looked up, his eyes bloodshot, and glanced at the mirror in the room. The mirror's surface had turned dark, with ripples moving within it. Lumian reluctantly set down his book, approached the mirror, and placed his right hand on it. He saw intision words appearing on the mirror's surface, line after line, densely packed. Professor's Invitation Academy Team's Offline Gathering Experiment with Transferring Items Lumian's thoughts raced. Taking advantage of the ice amulet's active effect, he reached into the mirror and pulled out an item. It was a diamond necklace. Beatrice's necklace. The copper coin and wraith dust mentioned in Franca's letter were gone. Lumian looked back at the mirror, seeing an image of the coin and wraith dust around the densely packed words with a ghostly presence. As the ice amulet's power waned and the words faded, the items gradually disappeared. Only pure information and items with Beyonder power can pass through that special mirror world through the seal, and reach here? Hmm, items with godhood shouldn't work either, only something made within Morora. Lumian played with Beatrice's necklace, using the ice amulet's remaining power to send Franca two words, necklace, okay. The aqueous glow within the mirror quickly receded, and the dark glass returned to normal. Soon, the mirror showed another anomaly. 
This time, Franca sent the ice amulet through. This helped Lumion conserve the use of the mirror cufflink only two uses left. Holding the icy talisman, Lumion began writing his reply. He detailed the experiment results and his observations on the item transfer process, then instructed Franca to attend the academy team's offline gathering in Trier as Muggle on his behalf. After folding the letter and enclosing the lie earrings and ice amulet, Lumion activated the latter, pressing the package into the glass mirror, sending it to Franca's apartment mirror. Franca received the items, read Lumion's letter carefully, and murmured to herself, both expectant and anxious. Do I really have to pretend to be Muggle? Sigh, the LCE amulet can only transmit information nine more times. Meanwhile, Lumion returned to his desk and resumed reading examples of underground mausoleum construction. He was reluctant to rest. The more he read, the more compelling the books became. Of course, Lumion knew this was a sign of slight corruption. Just then, he heard a loud explosion. It came from a few blocks away. Explosion? Lumion used his ascetic endurance to break free from the compulsion, extinguished the fireball, and moved to the window to observe outside. The explosions continued, with brilliant flames illuminating the streets hundreds of meters away. It was on the route from the carnivore bar to the Church of Knowledge. Lumion saw Julie jump out of her room, landing lightly like a feather, then blending into the shadows, disappearing. Hunters causing explosions and fires, Lumion rubbed his temples, looking reluctant. He grumbled to himself, I really don't want to get involved in your schemes and fights. I just want to study peacefully. Since discovering the important knowledge in the books specified by Hereberg, he had become increasingly focused, spending all his time reading except when acting outside. If not for the risk of exposing the book's importance, he would have used his special abilities to study all night. The more seriously he studied, the less he wanted to do anything else, often relying on sheer willpower and even his ascetic abilities to break free from that mental state. After a moment, Lumion's expression calmed, and he muttered to himself, When I find the opportunity to eliminate you all, I can finally study in peace. Suppressing his abnormal emotions, Lumion transformed into a shadow creature, slipping into the darkness between buildings and heading toward the explosion site. Soon, he reached the destination and saw a half-collapsed Building Dade's Agricultural Company. Wanax Dade's Agricultural Company? Someone attacked Wanak? Lumion snapped out of his study-induced haze, his mind suddenly alert. He saw two giant figures emerge from the building. They were three to four meters tall, with iron-like skin and blue paint depicting clothing, each holding a giant broadsword. Iron soldiers? Giant iron soldiers? Lumion immediately recalled the iron soldiers he had seen deep in the Sauron family's Red Swan Castle crypt. The next moment, one of the iron soldiers smashed through the collapsed wall and fixed its cold gaze on the shadow Lumion was hiding in. It charged at Lumion, raising its giant broadsword.